Okay, so welcome to the second day of our conference. Uh, so the first speaker of this morning is Aaron Lauda, and you can see the title right here. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks to the organizers for uh, having me here. So, so far, been a really great conference. Um, right, I, I'm going to talk about a categorification of quantum SL2, and I guess, I think the title I sent was Extended Graphical Calculus. So if you've seen this talk on SL2 before, I'm going to be uh, telling you some, some new things about that. Um, right, so for those that were in Michael's talk, we saw that uh, you could categorify, sorry, this is really, it, the volume is normal for everyone? Okay, just feels like a thing. Um, so for everybody that was in Michael's talk, you saw about how to categorify U plus. So you take this graph, and using the graph you can build this algebra, and what it's categorifying is half of the quantum group. And we can do this for any uh, simply laced katz moody algebra, so in particular all your favorite semi-simple Lie algebras, we can, we can do that story for U plus. And then Michael mentioned that, you know, basically how that worked was we took these pictures that had different colors and we imposed certain local relations on these pictures and this is, you know, we got an algebra structure by stacking these pictures on top of each other. So today what I want to tell you about is how to categorify the entire quantum group um, but just for the simplest Lie algebra SL2. So if you go back to what Michael was doing, um, I'll just be working with this graph today, the graph that looks like that. <laughs> but, so we'll try and categorify SL2. And just a reminder, why are we doing all this stuff with categorifying quantum groups? I mean, this is a representation theory. What does it have to do with not homology? The idea is that you can understand these um, quantum link invariants in terms of representation theory just by coloring the endpoints of the tangle by some weights for your, for your favorite uh, Lie algebra. And then a tangle gives you a map of representations or an intertwiner. And that map between those representations is, is your invariant. And if you compute it for an actual knot, you get a Laurent polynomial. And this is a, these, these quantum invariants that we're interested in. And of course, if we take the Lie algebra to be SL2 and we choose just the simplest representation, the defining representation, this is simplest after the trivial representation, uh, we get the Jones polynomial. And taking other representations, we can get colored Jones polynomial. And taking other Lie algebras, we get other known uh, quantum invariants. So the idea is if we could categorify this whole story, instead of putting uh, representations of some quantum group at the endpoints of a tangle, maybe we could put some categorified representations and then have these tangles give us some sort of you know, map between categorified representations, we would get somehow a more interesting theory. And in particular, if we were looking at the case of SL2, um, we would hope that this had something to do with Kovanov homology. So I want to be I want to tell you about quantum SL2. I just want to remind you the generators and relations. So if you're not familiar with quantum groups, it's it's pretty easy to describe. You just it's just an algebra with generators and relations that you can see there. Um, it's an algebra over rational functions in Q, and it's you know generated by E's, F's, and K's. And the cool thing about SL2 is that if you look at a representation. Um, it's going to be a vector space where we can break up this into just think about it as having a bunch of different vector spaces called, and we think that we break it up into eigenspaces for how k acts. So we call this the nth weight space because the, the element k will act on a vector that's in that nth weight space by some q to the n. And then how does our e's act on this weight space? The e's take us from the nth weight space to the n plus 2, and f's take us back again. So it's a pretty uh, simple algebra, and its representations have this nice structure of uh, being able to break them up into these weight spaces and hop around in these weight spaces using the E's and F's. <coughs> and so then, uh, just sort of, just vague reason, like, discussion on why we'd want to categorify these quantum groups. The point is, uh, one, if we're thinking about SL2, this would give us the, the representation theoretic explanation for Kovanov homology. So we've already categorified the Jones polynomial, uh, Michael has. Um, so then you like to understand, well, what does this have to do with quantum SL2 and its categorifications? 
And then if you can understand that, then you can ask, well, how can I categorify all Reshetikin tribe invariants, these you know, quantum link invariants? And then, of course, as Michael mentioned, Crane and Frankel were hoping to categorify these three-manifold invariants um, to get four-dimensional TQFTs. So maybe um, this is still far off since we don't know how to do roots of unity, but this is one of the um, objectives that we would like, like to see. Then, of course, if you're just a representation theorist, not a topologist, um, there's already been some interesting applications of categorified representation theory, categorification in representation theory, namely, uh, particularly geometric representation theory. You see that these categorified quantum groups give you this very combinatorial and algebraic analog of uh, perverse sheaves, which are much easier to work with, and a lot of nice facts about positivity and special bases for the quantum group can be understood in terms of this categorification. So a lot of the structure of quantum groups can be understood once we've categorified them. And it even has some applications to the good old uh, symmetric group. So there's some interesting uh, results about um, graded representation theory of the symmetric group and finite characteristic that you can get from uh, out of this theory as well. That's due to Vernon Kleshev. Okay, so the roadmap, how are we going to categorify? I mean, there's, there was a, basically a few clues along the road that said that this SL2 that I was, uh, was defining for you could be categorified. And one of them is the Lustig's important discovery of the uh, canonical basis. So this algebra has a very special basis. And what's so special about it, if I multiply any two elements, I get positive um, polynomials in Q with, with positive integer coefficients. And the idea is that when we categorify this plus that we see everywhere is going to turn into direct sum, and these natural numbers that are the coefficients will, how many times we're taking a direct sum. And then there's also lots of geometric constructions of categorical quantum group actions. So the fact that quantum groups like to act on categories tells you that maybe there's some fancier structure that's you know, some sort of categorified quantum group that's really acting and explaining these actions. And then there's this special form. Michael talked a little bit about this last time. I remember how the whole idea of the categorification of U plus was we were trying to build this algebra so that its graded dimension matched this bilinear form on the, on the U plus. Well, you can do exactly the same story. Take this form and try and use that to tell you information about how to categorify. Um, so this was actually a, a big help in trying to understand how to, how to categorify the quantum group. Uh, the, the version of the quantum group that we actually categorify is called the, uh, the, the in, in SLN it's due to Balin, and Lustig and McPherson. And basically what you're doing is you're adding a bunch of idempotents to this algebra, or you can projectors. And what you should think of them as doing is, I have this representation of uh, SL2. I'm going to add this new element that projects onto that nth weight space. So I'll call it 1 sub n. And basically, remember, k acted on the nth weight space by q to the n. So if I've added these projectors and I have it, you know, it's going to project onto that nth weight space. Well, how does k act on the nth weight space? By q to the n. So we can throw out this element q, and now we just have e's and f's and a bunch of these 1 sub n. So we've gotten rid of our unit element, and now we have um, a bunch of orthogonal idempotents, which project onto these different weight spaces. And then the relations just take on this nice form. The ones about the k's and the e's just tell us that E takes us from the nth weight space to the n plus 2 weight space. This was that picture of the E's hopping us along. And similarly, the F's take us from the nth weight space to the n minus 2 weight space. So we go down by 2, applying F. And then the most interesting relation, the sort of most exciting one, um, just turns into this, this relation. So it used to say k minus k inverse over q minus q inverse. But remember, since k acts by q to the n, and k inverse by q to the minus n, we just get this, what's called the quantum integer n. So the commutator between e and f is this quantum integer n. And this is the guy that we're going to try and categorify. This is the one that has the very special basis, this canonical basis. And I'll mention, um, we're going to try and realize this as the uh, split growth in the ring of some category, or more precisely a two category. So the point is, this algebra that I was telling you about was defined over rational functions in Q, but we'd like to have some version that's defined over um, Z adjoined Q, Q inverse. So if we, if we just look at these divided powers, where I t 
take e to the sum power a, but then I divide by quantum a factorial. So that's the quantum integer a times quantum integer a minus 1, some big messy Laurent polynomial. Um, if I look at just the things spanned by these guys, I'll get an, an algebra that's defined over, over the ring uh, zq q inverse. And this, this will make more sense when I try and look at it as the growth of the ring. And then, as I was saying, there's a special basis. If I choose this basis here, where it depends on the weight space n here. So if I choose the e going in front as long as n is less than b minus a, or the f going in front if n is bigger than b minus a, whenever I multiply these guys together, I'll get coefficients in here. Yeah. You didn't actually have to choose a representation, right? You No, no. And, and from the perspective of representation theory, studying modules for this u dot um, is the same as studying modules for the other algebra that admit a decomposition into weight spaces. So if you like studying modules that have these weight decompositions, then you can just study u dot. Okay, and this is the only reason I'm showing you these sort of ugly relations is because um, one of the new things I want to tell you about is how to categorify these relations. These are the um, generating relations for how these divided powers interact with each other. And these coefficients here, these are the Q binomial coefficients. So, you know, N over M, N minus M factorial. Um, you can imagine some crazy Laurent polynomials. Um, so, yeah, these are, these are the relations, and we'll see that we can actually categorify these using the extended graphical calculus I'll tell you about uh, later. Okay, so that's the algebra we want to categorify, and as I was mentioning, um, we're going to define a certain two-category, and the growth in the ring of this two-category is going to categorify um, u dot. So I'm going to think of a two-category in terms of certain pictures. I'm going to represent the objects as just regions in the plane colored by these weights n. So if you haven't thought about two categories very much, I think of them as just a place where you can draw pictures in the plane, and that's I mean, I think if you think of them that way, you can understand everything in this talk. So an object is representing a region in the plane. A morphism is something which goes, if we're going from right to left, um, it's represented, usually we think of it as the endpoints here, but here I've drawn it as an arrow. So this would be a picture of E, it's going from N to N plus 2. Here's a picture of F, it's decreasing the weights by 2. So the orientations here are telling us whether when I pass from right to left, I increase or decrease the weights. Um, and so you should sort of, this is sort of our picture for E's and F's. Um, we can take direct sums of these things. And in general, if I have a big string of E's and F's that I'm trying to categorify, I'll just draw that by putting a bunch of up arrows and down arrows corresponding to the E's and F's that I'm trying to categorify. This little grading shift, I'm allowed to think of these one morphisms as being graded. And the reason is, um, in the quantum group, I can multiply by Q, right? There's an element E, and there's an element Q times E. How do we categorify the multiplication by Q? Well, we just encode that in the grading shift. So shifting the grading by 1, we think of as being the action by this ZQQ inverse. How does Q act? It acts by shifting the grading by 1. So I told you the sort of boring structure, you know, we've got these weights, we've got these E's and F's, that's just like the U dot had. What's the new stuff? What, what's the new thing that happens in this categorified quantum group? And that's these pictures here. So if you ignore the orientation on the first line, it should look a lot like what Michael was telling us about. Um, it's just these crossings and the dots. What's new here is that the regions actually are labeled by weights. And the reason is um, the quantum group breaks up into a U plus part, the Cartan part, and a U minus part. So the U plus part we can think of as just the arrows that are going up. The U minus could be the arrows that are just going down. And this Cartan part is sort of it's in being encoded in the weights. By throwing in those idempotents, we got rid of K. But we do have these like weight spaces everywhere. And so the fact that I've labeled the regions on the right and left by weights for SL2 
2 are just indicating that um, you know, we're categorifying the entire quantum group, not just the plus part. So then the only new structure that you see um, are these caps and cups, which tells you how the E's and the S can interact with each other. So remember, an upward pointing arrow is supposed to be an E, a downward pointing arrow is supposed to be an F, and if you looked at the bilinear form I was showing you in the very beginning, it actually tells you that there should be a generator and that they should have these degrees which depend on N. So the degrees of the crossings and dots are exactly what Michael told you. Um, so a dot has degree 2, a crossing has degree minus 2. But what's interesting is that these caps and cups have a degree which very closely is related to the region that they're floating in. So we really care what weight space we're in when we're figuring out the degree there. So here's an example of, of kind of picture you could build using these things. And one of the interesting, yeah? Yeah, I'm going from right to left and bottom to top. So just think about the most complicated backwards way you can imagine. Uh, uh, yeah, so bottom, to, right to left, bottom to top. So this, that's why E takes us from N to N plus 2. The upward pointing arrow is in E. Okay, and one of the things to just notice is that you, get, you can build these closed diagrams by using the caps and cups with dots on them. And those guys will have some interesting structure, we'll find out as we go. Um, okay, so these are the generators, but I need to impose some relations on these, some local relations that we can, um, that will help us simplify very complicated diagrams into, into simpler ones. I mean, the idea is, since these are generators, I can glue these together in any possible way and create very complicated pictures like this. It might, we want to know how to simplify the, um, those pictures. So one of them says that I can wiggle out a zigzag piece of string. So if I ever do the zigzags, I can always straighten them out. And algebraically what that's saying is that E and F are by a joint. So if you've been to probably more than one of Michael's talks, you've probably heard him talking about by a joint functors a lot. Um, this by a joint structure seems to be sort of key when you're categorifying these E's and F's play uh, um, having this by a joint relationship. This part of the story we probably saw yesterday, so if you forget those orientations, this, what I call the Nil-Hecke relations, and this is defining an algebra called the Nil-Hecke algebra, um, give you just these relations. So this looks like a Reitermeister 3 kind of a move. The Reitermeister 2 move is kind of interesting because it's just equal to zero. And if you try and slide a dot through a crossing, you pick up an extra turn. So some sort of relation, some sort of analogs of these right and western moves we, we have for these guys. And notice all the strands are pointing up here. Another thing that makes this graphical calculus very intuitive, which allows you to sort of apply your topological intuition to these pictures and wiggle them around, is the fact that they have this, what's called being cyclic with respect to the biojoint structure. And all that means is, if I take an upward crossing and I twist it around like this to make a downward crossing, that's the same as if I twisted it the other way. So in general, this doesn't have to be true. But when it is true, it, gives, it means that your pictures are very topological, that you can twist them around and wiggle them about. So this is true for both a dot and a crossing. If you, you can, either way you twist them around, you'll get the same two morphism. And as a result, because it's true for all of our generators, it's true for any picture. If I take a picture, draw it in the plane, wiggle it around a bit, it'll represent the same two morphism in this two category as a result. So it's, these, these pictures can really start being taken seriously as, as little pieces of topology that you wiggle around. Yep. Right, if you, if you fix the, if you rotate it, it's a slightly different, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, because they'll have different sources and targets. It's just, you'll be taking like an adjoint or something like that. Yeah, planar tangles, um, and if and if you fix the endpoints and then do any, di yeah, isotopies, isotopy, isotopy yeah, preserving the boundary, then then you get the same. What, what is the additional structure coloring for the uh, complement? Orientations coloring for complement into this uh, numbers and those. Right. So one thing that we haven't defined is 
is a crossing going sideways. Like, what would that mean? Um, in particular, this would be a map that's going from F, E, into E, F. That's how we can switch the order of E's and F's. We can define this in either way by sort of taking an upward crossing and bending it around this way. Um, I mean, either of these two makes sense. The only reason I'm bringing this up is we'll use these maps a little bit later. So there's some way to define a sideways crossing, and any way you can write it down, it's fine. That's the definition. Um, because these two would always be the same. So, I told you that the structure of these bubbles is a little bit complicated, but it's actually quite interesting. We're going to see some um, sort of very surprising relationships with symmetric functions a little bit later. So, I have to spend a little bit of time explaining this to you. Um, what really matters for a bubble is what its degree is. So, you can almost forget about how many dots it has on it, as long as you know what degree the bubble is. And remember, the degree of a cap and a cup depended on the weight that you were in. It depended on the end that it was floating in. So these guys have degree, well, if it had beta many dots on it, it would have this degree here. And the, the other orientation, it would depend in a different way on it. And, in, and we impose a relation that says that um, if ever the degree is negative, like the total degree of the bubble together with the dots, then, we, then those, those bubbles are zero. What we're doing is we're forcing the maps from one end to one end to have a positive grading. If, if we were allowed negative bubbles, then, then we would have lots of negative things happening. Uh, there, there would just be negative guys. And it's sort of convenient from the perspective of, since I told you all we really care about in this story is the degree of these bubbles, if I write this, if I put n minus 1 dots on here and then add alpha, I can read its degree off as just 2 alpha. This is, I mean, all I'm saying is just figure out what the degrees are and put enough dots to where I can just read off very easily what the degree is. Here it happens to be minus n minus 1 dots. Yeah, no, I'm saying alpha is like an extra number of dots. Uh, it's a number. Yeah, yeah, it's how many dots? A natural number. Um, that's right. Except for, I'm almost, I might be lying a little bit, because you can see, depending on what n is, these often are not both positive. So I always want alpha to be a negative number, uh, a natural number, because the degree, remember, if alpha was ever a, a negative number, its degree would be negative, and then we would just say it's zero by the first rule. But th this is mostly just a convention. Um, the point is, sometimes that number is negative, but it, it really doesn't matter, honestly. What we're going to do is we'll define what these mean when they're negative, and there's a very natural way of defining So when these are negative, just treat it as some formal symbol but the moral of the of this story is this formal symbol you can treat as though it were actually a bubble. You can be, it, it, it behaves in exactly the same way as your other bubbles do. Let me show you how they're defined, and then I'll I'll say a bit about this. So I call these a fake bubble when their degree is bigger than zero, but the total number of dots that we're putting on the is that it's actually a negative number. Because remember. This number, alpha, is telling us how many times we're putting a dot. If it's a negative number, it just doesn't even make sense. It's saying, take a composite a negative number of times. It's, it's not defined. Yeah. yeah. Right. So a cup... So this guy here has degree n. Uh, sorry, 1 minus n. If it's floating in region n, and it looks like this, it has degree 1 minus n. So if I took this guy here, he also has degree 1 minus n. If there's n is out here. So if I put these two together, this now has degree uh, 2 minus 2n. So if I want to make this, start making this positive, I could add n minus 1 dots, a dot has degree 2, so this would be degree plus 2n minus 2, because I put n minus 1, so 2 times this number. So now this is degree 0. And if I add one more dot, it's degree two, you know, 2. If I add 2 dots, it's degree 4, etc. So that's what I'm doing here by... Um, 
putting this number out front, this guy's degree 0, this guy's degree 2 alpha. Uh, so what is the reason that you do not want to have negative dots? Well, if we put negative dots then on the growth indic ring, it would, um, if the dot is invertible, it would affect the growth indic ring, um, and so we really don't want to make the dot invertible. Um, yeah, I mean, let's see. Uh, if the dot were invertible, yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember exactly the reason, but I know that it gives you the wrong growth in the green. Um, okay, and so the point is, these are just some, con they're just, the point is, when we write down the definition, it's, it's much nicer to have these fake symbols around because they make writing down, writing down the relations very simple. Yeah. Why is it problematic to have negative degree functions? Um, that's a good question. Um, why do you have negative degree problems? I mean, one of the things that it would do is it would make the um, degree zero maps from one end to one end, possibly infinite dimensional. I mean, if you had negative degrees. Um, yeah, also there's this, uh, what I'll show you on the next slide is that there's some reason to think that this should have something to do with symmetric functions, and when you kill the negative degree bubbles, that relationship becomes very apparent. So in particular, this relationship between the fake bubbles and the real bubbles um, is very closely connected to the relationship between elementary symmetric functions and complete symmetric functions. So if I take any, this is a, a map from one end to one end. So you should think of this as some closed diagram built from these pictures. So it could be crazy crossing some very complicated picture. It turns out you can always take that complicated picture and use the relations to simplify it to where it's just a bunch of dotted bubbles that all have the same orientation. And it, since we've killed the negative degree ones, we actually get an isomorphism between uh, this Hom space of closed diagrams and symmetric functions where I take, say, the degree R bubble to the elementary symmetric function. And um, if you prefer to take the other orientation, you could think of that as mapping to the complete symmetric functions. And the reason why would we, why am I even mentioning this? Because the relationship between elementary and complete symmetric functions is exactly the same as this relationship between these uh, fake bubbles and the real bubbles. Yep. That's a complete symmetric function. Right. <laughs> in the same way that 
using the relations, I could always write any closed diagram in terms of bubbles with one orientation or bubbles with the other orientation. So this relationship, remember I told you we're going to define these. Um, so depending on what n is, the certain, like the first n minus 1 of these guys might be, would be fake, right? The first up till alpha got to n minus 1, if n was positive, these first n minus 1 would be fake. How are they defined? They're inductively defined by this equation. So the first one, you know, you, you can set equal to 1, and then you solve this equation to get how a fake bubble is defined in terms of real bubbles. Um, so how these formal symbols are defined in terms of something which actually is defined in this graphical calculus. But the point is, there's this nice analogy where, you know, th this is actually, if you collect the homogeneous terms in this equation, like, which is what I'm saying here, th this equation says take the homogeneous terms in, in T here and set them equal to 1. So the degree 0 piece is equal to 1. All the other higher powers of T you set equal to 0. So you get this relation here that says if you're summing from to alpha over L, it's equal to the chronic reductive. So if alpha is 0, it's equal to 1. Otherwise, it's they're equal to 0. And you can use these equations to define them. But the point is, this relationship that I've written up here is exactly the relationship between the elementary and complete symmetric functions. And it turns out that we're going to have, this is going to, there's going to be further implications when we start thinking about this uh, thick calculus. Sorry, I have one more question. Sure. Um, I don't know if this was implicit in the relations you mentioned, but can you move a nested bubble outside of a bubble? Yeah, I need to finish, there's a few more relations I need to tell you, but that's a good point. So I, I'm trying to tell you that any complicated picture can be reduced to just bubbles, and they can always be made to have the same orientation. So you were wondering, well, how do I get rid of something like this? Um, depending on the number of dots, uh, basically the way you do this is you take this, which you could also think of as this, and you're going to tell me, well, this is zero, but maybe I need to put some number of dots here first. Maybe there were some dots here. Um, so then it wouldn't be zero. You simplify this, it, you get some complicated picture like this, with there's some sum. Or you simplify this picture, moving it out that way. Um, so basically, using the Reitermeister 2 type relations, you can go from taking a bubble on one side to putting it on the other side. So we used not only the Reitermeister 2 move, but we also used isotopy invariance to say that this picture was the same as this picture. If they're on the bottom, we'll have to Sorry. No, this one's okay, right? What, what got screwed up? Oh. That's the same picture. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh. Maybe I want to go like this. There. Sorry. This is what I wanted to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. No? Okay, sorry. Yeah. What are you doing anyway with this? Um, sorry. The, the, the question was how do you get a, not, a, a nested bubble out? How do you unnest a bubble? Yeah. And I'm trying to say that there's formulas which you could use to slide a bubble through a line. So if I have a bubble on one side of a line, say it's degree alpha, how do I get this bubble onto the other side of the line? And I'm saying the way you do it is you use a combination of Reitermeister moves and um, isotopy invariance, um, which I was attempting to draw and getting my orientations completely screwed up. Uh, so there is, there is a formula that says something like if you slide this over, you get some combination of putting dots here and lowering the something like this with some coefficients. Okay, and so what was I telling you about why I mean where do these fake bubbles show up and why I mean why are they worth defining? The point is we want to categorify this main SL2 relation. 
like the fact that the EF should be isomorphic to FE plus a bunch of copies of the identity. So the way I want to do that is I want to think of having this is the middle, this is the uh, bunch of copies of the identity shifted by their grading according to quantum n. So I have this big direct sum here and then direct sum FE. And I'd like to construct an isomorphism from this side to just EF. All right, that's what it would mean to categorify this relation, is to construct isomorphisms which realize those SL2 relations. So going from EF into, sorry, FE into EF, we had this obvious map where I could just cross the, um, do this leftward crossing, right? So down at the bottom I have FE, at the top I have EF. And then over here there's some sort of obvious maps, right? If I want to go from 1 sub n into EF, how could I do that? Well, I could use a cuff, right? It starts with the identity on weight space n and ends with EF. Why did I put so many dots on there? Well, it's to do with this grading shift here. For it to be a degree zero map, I need to put a, the right number of dots. So this, this part of the map is, is, is really easy to find. It's sort of obvious that I mean, this, this should be the map that you, would, you want to write down. How on earth, I mean, what's the inverse of this thing going to be? Well, it turns out that the inverse is most naturally described using these fake bubbles. So notice here, I'm assuming in this case that n is positive. But notice that if n is positive, um, this number is always going to be negative. It'll be a positive degree, but it will be a negative. These guys are always going to be fake bubbles. So I'm using those fake bubbles intrinsically in how I'm defining the inverse of this map. So. So if you're asking me, well, why would you go through that? The fake bubble stuff seemed really complicated. Why, why are you using it? Well, the inverse of this map is very complicated. And to specify it, those symbols make it a lot simpler. Imagine if I had to use that inductive definition of the fake bubble. Writing down this inverse would be horrible, and it would depend on n in a very complicated way. Using the fake bubbles, I can write it down in a nice, simple way. And so finally, you get these last relations, which are some analogs. Yep, sure. In this proof. So, finally, can you combine all the pieces of this puzzle to a simple picture? Right, so like if I compose like this guy with this guy and this guy and take the sum, like that should be the identity on this guy, right? The identity on EF should be the sum of all these maps. That should be one of our axioms, for example. And another thing should say, if I start here, I go up, and then I go here, that should be zero, right? I mean, if I start in the middle, I mean, part of saying that this is an isomorphism is, is saying all those things. If I start here, I go up, I come back here, that should be the identity. Um, this picture represents a sum of diagrams, or? This picture, this represents a, an isomorphism. I'm writing down a map from here to here, and I've written down a map from here to here. We'd like it to be an isomorphism. And to make it be an isomorphism, I impose just a few extra relations. In particular, that what we were talking about here, the identity on EF should be the sum of all those pictures. This is exactly what you get by going along each of those. This is going along the leftmost side, and these guys are what you get by going along the various rows. And that's right. Each of the summons should also be an item potent. Exactly. And these, each of these ones are, are going to be item potent. Um, and the fact that like we want to get... Um, I mean, this, this top relation is, is also related to the fact that we want um, that map to be an isomorphism as well. This is what happens if we go along the left side and then get some bubbles glued on. Or another way to think of these is just that we have some analog of Reitermeister 1 move and some analog of Reitermeister 2 move when the orientations are going up and down. Um, the relate, the, it's a very complicated analog because in particular this sum involves these fake bubbles which are these inductively defined symbols. So um, it's quite complicated in general to do a Reitermeister move. But let me point out, if n were negative, this whole term is zero. Sum to n minus 1, this, this whole entire term would be 0 if n were negative. So in that case, for negative n, if you have an e on the left and an f on the right, you can just pull them apart. But not the other way around. So if n were negative in this case, 
this term is just fine, and you get a, it's really hard to do right of extra two move. Okay, so these relations were motivated by the fact that we wanted to have these SL2 relations categorified. This main relation for SL2, we'd like to lift to an isomorphism, and that's, that's exactly where these relations come from. Now, right. No, no, these ones are new. You have to impose these. Which? They follow from which relations? The definition of fake bubbles follows from these, but I don't know if it goes the other way around. So these are axioms, right? These are axioms, yeah. Sorry. I, it was a very, very long description of the axioms for this two category, but we're now done. Um, so we had these isotopy invariants, um, adjoints, nil hecker relations, and then these crazy ones, and that's it. Um, so this is the fine? This is the two category. Yeah. This, this is the guy who categorifies U dot. Um, Okay, right, let me just go through them real fast. Um, okay, here, by adjointness and nil hecka, topological invariants, which is these, uh, these ones. This is just a definition, we can forget about that. This is an axiom that negative degree bubbles are zero. This is just a discussion. Discussion. This, is, this, this equation follows from the other ones. And then this is e motivation. We want this relation to be categorified. And that leads us to these two axioms. So everything that was in a blue box was an axiom. And, and that's the list. <laughs> uh, the fake bubbles follow from, I mean, sorry, the infinite cross modian relation follows from these. But I don't think the other way around. But we can talk later. <laughs> Um, I don't want to talk about Let's see. So one issue that we didn't really talk much about was these divided powers. Um, how do you categorify the divided powers? If we're interested in this, you know, integral version where I have these, you know, divided powers showing up, how are you going to categorify that? Um, in particular. E squared should break up in, in this way, right? If, if the divided power is defined by that equation, we'd like to see this categorified and show that the object associated to E squared breaks up into a direct sum um, into some other object, which we're calling the divided power. How are we going to realize this? Um, how are we going to categorify this, 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 this equation here at the top? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to define an item potent that goes from, you know, two up arrows. So E squared is just having two up arrows right side by side. So I'm going to define an item on E squared that actually splits it into a direct sum here. So I claim that, we, I guess we saw this in Michael's talk, that, that this crossing with the dot was an item And how do you prove that? Well, you use that nil hecka relation the top is the nil hecka relation. This picture is zero because it involves an upward pointing right western two move. So it tells you that, I think Michael called it exploding the crossing. If you have a crossing, you can turn it into two crossings with a dot in the middle. So in particular, if I take this guy and multiply by itself, I get this, which I can just write in this way using that top relation. And what I want to do is I'm going to actually define the divided power to be the image of that idempotent. And it turns out that if I look at this idempotent and 1 minus that idempotent, I actually get um, those, those two things are going to be isomorphic. So anytime we have a ring and we have an idempotent, we can get a splitting in this way between the idempotent and 1 minus it. So in the Karubi envelope of this two category, so now, now I'm extending this two category a bit, I want to look at a place where idempotents split. So here I'm normally talking about just formal pictures, right? I'm just saying, here's a diagram. But now I want to say the image of a certain diagram. Well, what does that make sense? How do you, how do you define this image of idempotents in, in this sort of abstract diagram category? Well, you can't. And the, and the way to get around that is you pass to what's called the Kruby envelope, or the idempotent completion. So what it is, is you take your, your category and you just enlarge it.
to a bigger category where now you say that idempotents, now idempotents can split. So I'll show you the definition of that in the next slide. But the point is, if we allow idempotents to split, then I can break this guy up into a direct sum in this way, using the image of this idempotent that I defined on the previous slide. And what you would get, um, it turns out that these two guys are going to be isomorphic. It's not obvious, but it's, it's, it's true. And so we really would get a, you, you do get a categorification of the divided powers using this idempotent trick. So what's the Kruby envelope if you've never seen that before? Um, well, if you have a category, so it's this minimal enlargement where all the idempotents split. So what's an object in there? Well, it's just an object of your old category together with an idempotent. And what you should really think of this pair, an object and an idempotent, as being the image of that item potent, right? So I think of this pair B and E being the image of the item potent E. On, so B, E is a map from B to B. E is the image of that item potent. And so what's a morphism? Well, it's just anything that gets along with this item potent in this way. The identity morphisms are just this very boring triple. And the point is, if we're working in an additive category, we can we really do get this splitting of B into the image of E and the image of 1 minus E, where I'm thinking of this, that this as being the image. Okay, so we've built this new category by adding, enlarging it to have item potents. This is the Kruby envelope. And, in, and for us, I mean, in terms of, if you just want to think in terms of pictures, um, we're taking the Kruby envelope of all the home spaces here, and something that's in the, a two-morphism, uh, so I'm defining this two-category U dot now as the Kruby envelope of this diagram category that we started with. So we had a two-category U, it was defined in terms of these relations that we saw, and the two-category that I actually, that actually categorifies is the Kruby envelope where we've um, added splitting of idempotents. And a two-morphism in here can be pictured as some sort of, I'm just drawing it as a box to represent anything that you want to put in there, such that it's the same if I put this idempotent on the top or the bottom. So going between these two elements in the Kruby envelope, it, you just want it to behave well with respect to those idempotents. And if you were wondering how, how do we define the divided powers in general, I just told you about divided power for two. Well, it's in general, it's given by the longest possible crossing together with this, these dot arrangements. So A minus one, A minus two, up to there. You can show using facts about the nil Heck algebra that this is an idempotent. And you, this gives rise to this a categorification of this, this relationship between A and divided powers. So this is not obvious that that's an idempotent. I'm just saying that you can show this is an idempotent, and this is how we define divided powers in general. So the theorem is that this, this two-category U dot, which is the Kruby envelope of this diagram category, it has growth and degreeing, which really is the integral version of U dot that we started with. So this quantum group that we started with is really just the growth and degreeing of this two category that I've defined. Um, the way that growth and degreeing is, whenever we have a direct sum in U dot, it, we get this addition in the growth and degreeing. So you might notice that you get a very natural basis in the growth and degreeing. Oh, sorry. Two one morphisms, yeah. So because I have a two category here, uh, yeah, that's right. Two one morphisms in U dot. Thanks. Uh, I want to understand this passage from uh, first uh, kind of pictures to second kind. So first you you uh, have a graphic of calculus in the previous category without adding this item coordinates or. That's right. I mean, at this stage, right now, um, right now we don't. I don't have any, I mean, uh, what I meant to tell you about was how to draw pictures in the Kruby envelope, but I probably won't have time to say that. So all we have is this two-category U. This has those pictures that we talked about. You pass to its Kruby envelope, U dot, 
no longer have pictures. Um, you, d you don't have pictures here. You just have images of this item potent. I mean, in some sense, you have pictures. I, I mean, I can say, well, what am I talking about? The image of this item potent. Um, I mean, I mean, the point is, if you're working with the, crew, the item potent completion of a certain two category, you can understand a lot about this two category just by thinking about this one. Um, to, to understand this two category diagrammatically, you have to sort of thicken the calculus in a certain way. Um, add basically that item potent that I showed you, this E sub A. So over here, this looks like you know this crazy complicated picture with some dots. And I said that I wanted my divided power, so the divided power lived over here. He's the image of this item potent. If this is E sub A, so here's, here's an item potent, and I'm saying the image of this is what I want to be called this. Which was called what? Magic Reef. I, I don't know about this at all. Yes. Magic Reef. You mean the Jones Super Yes. Oh. No, I mean they, they look they look they, formally they look like that, but they're not they're not Jones. I mean there's no there's no direct question. Oh, no. I mean just that we're drawing I'm drawing this box to mean this picture. That's the only similarity is that I'm using boxes. Okay. Um, okay. So. Right, Michael, I mean, you... you yeah, right, I mean, in, in the same way that, that in, in, in that calculus, um, a box was a, a symbol that describes something more complicated, that's the same, the same here. So, okay. So this is the story, is that I'm defining this guy to be the image of E sub A. So in some sense I have a picture, you know, it's this picture. It's the image of this thing. But what we do in the, in the new paper with Marco Mackay, Marco Stoschik, and Michael, is we actually draw a new, completely new picture for this, which looks like this, and with thickness A. And, and then you can work out the relations that these thick pictures satisfy and there's some very elaborate combinatorics that shows up. Uh, um, that, that show up in this way. Okay. Um, okay, so the point I wanted to make is, you know, whenever we have a direct sum of one morphisms in U dot, in the growth in the ring, we get this, you know, symbol of X plus the symbol of Y in the growth in the ring. But you'll notice that there's a very natural basis that arises for the quantum group. As soon as we have this categorification theorem, as soon as I know that the growth link ring is the quantum group, well, I, I automatically also know that there's a very special basis for the quantum group. Namely, the basis given by the indecomposable one morphisms. So just take those one morphisms that you can't break up into a direct sum of anything else. Those guys are going to be a basis in the growth link ring. It's going to be a special basis where whenever I multiply two things, I always get a positive combination of Y because it's a, it's a category. I only have direct sums. Um, and it turns out that in the case of SL2, this is the same as the loosely canonical basis for SL2. Um, and then if you look at the Homs, this is a very similar to the story Michael was telling you. The graded Homs between any two one morphisms, that categorifies this special form on the quantum group. And one thing that actually gives us, make, helps us to make a little bit more sense as well, is I mentioned some of these geometric examples where we know that you know, SL2 or SLN more generally is acting on some sort of geometry. Uh, in particular, there's this example where it's acting on cohomology rings of, of certain flag varieties. Um, and this two category acts on, in that setting. So in other words, I can actually show that all those weird relations I was writing on the board are satisfied in this examples of these um, representations on these flag varieties or uh, categories of modules over these flag varieties. And sort of there's a extension of this work. If you take what Michael told you about yesterday, this rings are new, those, and think of those as being the sort of upward strands, 
and you combine the SL2 part that I just told you about now, um, you get a definition for any Katsumudi algebra, any simple semi-simple Lie algebra, you get a, a, a two category. And for SLN, we showed that it, it's had the right growth and degree. Um, and we conjectured that, in general, it also categorifies the quantum group. And I think this is in Ben Webster's, uh, one of his new papers, he's um, shown that this is true. Um, okay, so there, I mean, and there's also some very, there's some related two categories that were studied by Chuang and Ruquier um, that sort of have some, that fit into this picture as well. Also, um, there's geometric notions. As I mentioned, there's lots of interplay between geometry and the representation theory, and this is in the work of Kaudis, Kaminser, and Makata, um, where these geometric notions of categorical SL2 actions were studied. So I think I'm going to call it quits here. Um, sorry I didn't get to tell you about the extended calculus, but it's probably a lot for one day. <laughs> Yeah, sure. So that's what <laughs> that's what the thick calculus looks like. It's the thick green arrow, and you get things that look like splitters, you know, for inclusions of certain sumands, and you get you know caps and cups, and um, you can take a thick line and explode it into thin lines, and it turns out that sure polynomials have a really natural description here, where I just put like. This is that a minus 1, a minus 2, etc. But if I take some uh, partition and put those many dots in this exploded line, it turns out to give me exactly uh, a sure polynomial, um, which is sort of surprising. Um, one of this, this is why I spent so long telling you about this relationship between elementary and complete symmetric functions, is because if you take one of these thick lines, a bubble with, uh, with thick lines, you explode it, you pull it around, and you simplify it using all these crazy relations. It turns out that you actually get the exact uh, Jacob Trudy formula for a sure polynomial in terms of the elementary. So remember, these guys are like the elementary, these guys are, I guess, the complete symmetric functions. Um, it turns out that simplifying this formula using that isomorphism that I told you about gives you exactly the expansion. Um, that you, for the Jacob Trudy formula. And you can write down explicit maps which categorify those very complicated relations I was telling you about um, for in u dot. And they look like this. And then the one that's really crazy, <laughs> these maps here are, are uh, for the one involving e's and f's. This just looks horrible. <laughs> but uh, the relation you get is this one. This is how that uh, complicated relation that I had looks when you've uh, generalized it. These are some complicated uh, uh, Littlewood Richardson coefficients, products of Littlewood Richardson coefficients. And uh, this was proved by our collaborator, Marco Stoschik. So we call it the Stoschik theorem. And so the decomposition of the identity morphism of the decomposable Right. So just as the way E and F broke up into a direct sum of um, the indecomposables in the in the original SL2 definition, just for one E and one F, this is giving you the decomposition of E A divided power E B divided or sorry F B divided power into indecomposable. So this stuff would take a little bit longer to explain, but one of the results of all these very complicated calculus is that you can now prove the theorem I told you, the categorification theorem, um, over the integers. So um, the result that I told you about before, I was working over a ground field, k. In other words, I was taking k linear combinations of pictures. But um, using these, because I get, we have these explicit isomorphisms for all those relations, let me just point out those relations. Here. Th that was what we were categorifying with all those very strange pictures is constructing isomorphisms which realize these explicitly. So you can now state the categorification theorem over the integers, which is which is sort of which is a new result. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, is it possible to say you guys have no extended system? 
Um, what was the question? And to what extent the categorification is unique. Um, working with the, one of my collaborators, Simon Cowdes, we have some partial results in that direction, but um, there's, of course, certain assumptions that have to be made. Uh, so, for example, I mean, Rukier studies categorifications as well, and I don't think that the two categories in those settings are the same. But, but his doesn't have this growth in the green, which is, um, which is the quantum group. So, if, if you're saying, do I know that if you have the growth in the green, the quantum group, is, does it have to be this two category? I don't know. It's not, it's not known. But there's possibly some very natural assumptions you can add to that statement, which would make it be unique. It seems, in, I mean, what's my impression is that it's incredibly rigid, um, that, there, that there is not much there, um, that there's not much you can do to change it. What is the relation, if any, uh, to uh, USB network? network? Um, not enough, I guess. <laughs> um, it, it looks very similar, but